this is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news compiled in the early hours of the morning on Wednesday the 3rd of January. I'm Alex Ritson with a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service News today. Coming up, the United States says it wants to call an emergency session of the UN Security Council to discuss Iran, where anti-government protests have continued. Dozens have already been killed. Hundreds have been arrested. If the Iranian dictatorship's history is any guide, we can expect more outrageous abuses in the days to come. Also in the podcast, tens of thousands of African migrants in Israel are being given a choice of cash to leave the country or jail. We are not talking about asylum seekers whose claims have been rejected in a fair and effective manner. A coach has crashed in Peru, killing at least 36 people. And later, why computers in the future could be replacing cardiologists in the diagnosis of heart disease. 20 years from now, healthcare will have AI embedded at a whole variety of different levels, and much of the healthcare system will be enabled by smart systems that help you identify people at risk. But first, the United States says it plans to call an emergency session of the UN Security Council on Iran, where anti-government protests have continued for a sixth day. The American ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, said the US wished to amplify the voices of the Iranian people who were, she said, showing tremendous courage. And she dismissed as ridiculous claims by the Iranian government that the protests were designed by outside forces. Now the Iranian dictatorship is trying to do what it always does which is to say that the protests were designed by Iran's enemies. We all know that's complete nonsense. The demonstrations are completely spontaneous. They are virtually in every city in Iran. This is the precise picture of a long oppressed people rising up against their dictators. The Iranian government has said it will organize counter rallies on Wednesday in areas where the protests have been strongest. I spoke to the BBC's UN reporter, Neda Torfik, and asked her how likely it is there'll be an emergency meeting of the Security Council on Iran. We've seen the Trump administration really take a different approach than the Obama administration, which really tried to stand back from any issues in Iran, uh, lest they be accused of interfering. But we've had the White House say that it's time for change there. We've had the State Department say that they have an obligation not to stand by. And now Nikki Haley is taking her case to the United Nations. Uh, so she's making the argument that people in Iran are, are calling for freedom and all freedom loving people have to stand with them. Uh, the issue here is that there's a bit of a split in the Security Council. On, on one hand, you have countries that kind of have a direct link between human rights and threats to international peace and security, because that's what the Security Council meets on, threats to international peace and security. But you have those like China and Russia who are very afraid of kind of setting a precedent of discussing countries' internal conflicts or internal political situations uh, in case they fall back on them in the future. Future. So Nikki Haley is going to have to present her issue, uh, her case to Security Council members, and it's unclear how much support she would have in the council to actually hold that open emergency meeting. Now, Nikki Haley says it's ridiculous to claim that the protests were orchestrated by outside forces, but President Trump hasn't made any secret of his beliefs, has he? Yeah, she says it's complete nonsense and that these uh, protests are spontaneous. But again, President Trump has been tweeting on Iran for days. He says the people of Iran are finally acting against the brutal and corrupt Iranian regime. All the money that President Obama so foolishly gave them went into terrorism into their pockets. So he's really trying to step back from this being just an economic issue and making this an issue about the regime itself. Um, and, and certainly the protesters have different issues um, that they are protesting about. But the White House and we see this with Nikki Haley now, uh, is trying to, again, they've been very hawkish on Iran, taking a tougher stance on Iran. And so we have both of them here trying to say it's a problem with the government, the people are angry with the government, uh, and that's why there's all of these protests that we've seen these last few days. Very briefly, the United States has called on Tehran to lift all restrictions on social media. Yeah, absolutely. President Trump, he loves Twitter. Um, the White House has urged uh, Iran to kind of take back any restrictions they have from Instagram and other social media platforms. They say if they have nothing to hide, then people should have access to post what they want. And Nikki Haley, when she spoke to reporters, she said she wanted to amplify the, the voice of Iranians. And she read several posts uh, that she claimed were from Iranians on social media. Neda Torfik in New York.
Now to a story from Israel where tens of thousands of African migrants have been given 90 days to leave the country. If they go, they'll be given a stipend of over $3,000. If they don't, they'll be locked up. So what's going on? I spoke to the BBC's James Copnell. Well, there are almost 40,000 of them. They're described by the Israeli authorities as infiltrators. That's the word they use for people who came into the country not using official uh, border points. They're mainly Eritrean in particular, but also Sudanese. So they will have made their way up through Sudan and Egypt and then uh, into Israel. And largely they are uh, failed asylum seekers. And now the Israelis are planning to deport them. Yes, and it's all part of really an, an ongoing uh, court battle. There's been sort of rumours of this or reports of this for the last sort of couple of years or so, but it now seems that the decision has been taken, though details are still uh, a little bit scanty. But in essence, all these people have three months to either leave the country to go back to their home uh, nation or uh, they could be airlifted to Uganda or Rwanda, other African countries that have agreed apparently to take in uh, these people. Those who don't go would be uh, locked up. Uh, there are exemptions, uh, in particular children and older people, uh, victims of trafficking and slavery and things like that. And human rights groups have been outraged. Yeah, basically they're objecting to what they see as the forced nature of this repatriation, saying that these people simply don't have a choice. Uh, and one of the key groups here are obviously the Eritreans, and many of them leave their country because of... Uh, the uh, compulsory national service that can actually last many years in that country. Uh, now, Israel, it seems, doesn't recognise that as a reason to give these people uh, refugee status. Uh, and so the UN's refugee body, UNHCR, uh, is up in arms about this. This is UNHCR's Walpurga Engelbrecht. We are not talking about asylum seekers whose claims have been rejected in a fair and effective manner, but rather on a policy by the Ministry of Interior, according to which draft evasion and desertion from Eritrea, they argue, does not fall under the 1951 Refugee Convention. We beg to differ. So certainly the main concern is that they are not finding adequate protection. So that's Walpurga Engelbrecht from uh, UNHCR. And UNHCR and others say that actually they're still a little bit in the dark about what exactly uh, the Israeli authorities have decided on. But the Israeli government does say that uh, these returns will be voluntary and humane. James Copnell. A coach carrying some 50 passengers in Peru has crashed on a dangerous stretch of coastal road north of the capital, Lima, plummeting nearly 100 metres down a cliff. A government official said at least 36 people were killed. Our America's editor, Leonardo Rocha, reports. Witnesses say the driver lost control after the coach collided with another vehicle. It went over the edge of the road and landed upside down on the deserted beach. Several survivors have been airlifted to local hospitals, while rescuers continue to work in the area. The accident happened on the notorious Devil's Turn, about 50 kilometers from the coach's final destination, Lima. The Pasamayo Serpentine, as it's known locally, is often listed among the world's most dangerous roads. It's busy, it's frequently covered by fog, and it's largely unprotected by safety fences. Leonardo Rocha. The influential Roman Catholic Archbishop of Kinshasa has sharply criticised the Congolese government over the suppression of opposition protests on New Year's Eve. At least seven people were killed as police used live bullets to break up the rallies. Archbishop Laurent Monsenguo Passigna described the actions of the security forces as barbaric. Here's our Africa editor, Mary Harper. The Archbishop asked how the Congolese could have confidence in leaders who were incapable of protecting the population. He said it was time for mediocre people to leave office and for the truth to replace systematic lies. Police fired live bullets at protesters and tear gas into churches during the New Year's Eve rallies, which were called by Catholic activists. They were protesting against the Congolese president, Joseph Kabila, who was meant to leave office in 2016, but is now staying until the end of this year. Russia is gearing up to host the 2018 World Cup in cities stretching from Yekaterinburg in the east to Kaliningrad in the west. 
As football fans begin to make plans, the BBC's Moscow correspondents Sarah Rainsford and Steve Rosenberg have been on a tour of all 11 cities and 12 venues to bring a flavour of what Russia has to offer, from larder cars and Cossacks to novelty burgers and a fortune-telling meerkat. In the first of their reports, Steve Rosenberg starts his travels in Tatarstan. Well, you can forget taxis and buses. This is the way to get around Kazan. I'm in a horse and carriage going around the centre of this city, which is the capital city of Tatarstan, a mainly Muslim region of central Russia. It's rich in history and culture. It's got its own Kremlin, which we're riding past right now. It's also rich in oil, which makes it one of the wealthiest regions of Russia. Well, I'm in the World Cup stadium now in Kazan where the home team, Rubin Kazan, is playing a match. It's a pretty new stadium and it's been designed by the same team of architects that designed Wembley Stadium and the Emirates Stadium in London. Well, I've moved now to a Tatarstan restaurant in Kazan. And I have to say, for hungry football fans coming here, there's plenty of choice. For example, the chef is now making well, the Tatarstan version of a famous British food, the good old Cornish pasty. It's called Etch Mug. It's made of beef, potatoes and onions. Let's just hope the teams who play here will be hungry for victory. I'm in Yekaterinburg in the Ural Mountains. This is the furthest east you'll need to travel for this World Cup. Two time zones from Moscow. Yekaterinburg is Russia's third largest city and it's also the place where two continents meet. There's a monument which marks that fact. So right now I'm standing with one foot in Asia and the other foot in Europe. It's also snowing quite hard right now. Let's hope it warms up come kickoff time. Otherwise the teams might get cold feet. Well, I'm outside the stadium, the Yekaterinburg Arena, it's called. It was actually built by German prisoners of war after World War II, but it's now being given a 21st century facelift. And to make sure that it meets the World Cup minimum capacity requirement of 35,000, they've come up with a, an interesting solution. They've put up these temporary stands almost outside the stadium, looking in. And if you'd like to know who's going to lift the World Cup trophy, well, meet a friend of mine. I'm at the Yekaterinburg Zoo and you can probably hear the scratching of a meerkat. This is Suri, the fortune-telling meerkat. I'm told he has plenty of experience picking winners in soccer tournaments and they've put out two bowls, one with a, an English flag and one with a Russian flag. Let's see which one he uh, goes to first. It's the English one. That's a good sign. Well, Moscow is a great draw because there's so much to see here. I'm in Red Square right now and it's got everything. There are the psychedelic onion domes of St Basil's Cathedral. Next door there's the Kremlin where Vladimir Putin has his office and there's another Vladimir over there in the mausoleum, this time the embalmed body of Vladimir Lenin. And speaking of Lenin, the Moscow Stadium where I am now used to be called the Lenin Stadium after the man who made the Russian Revolution. Today, it's known as Luzhniki. Capacity, 81,000. This is where the World Cup final will be played. And getting around Moscow is pretty easy and very cheap if you use the Moscow Metro. And they've been putting in more signs in English to make Moscow's tube more user-friendly for foreigners. It's also stunningly beautiful down here with dramatic communist-era statues and mosaics. It's a bit like riding around a subterranean Soviet museum. That report by Steve Rosenberg in Tatarstan. You're listening to Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service.
And don't forget, there are lots of other podcast series from the BBC World Service, and there's one place to find out what's new and to discover the very best podcasts to listen to. Our newsletter. It couldn't be easier to get it. Search online for BBC World Service newsletter or go to bbcworldservice.com slash newsletter. Sign up and the newsletter with its fantastic podcast recommendations will be sent straight to your inbox. And don't forget our brand new podcast series, The Assassination with Owen Bennett-Jones, which is truly brilliant. Police in Ukraine have started a murder investigation after the body of a lawyer and human rights activist was found in a river near the capital, Kiev. Irina Nozdrovska went missing on the 29th of December. Warren Bull reports. Irina Nozdrovska was a prominent human rights activist in Ukraine and had devoted much of her time recently on the court case of her sister, who was killed in 2015 by a car driven by the nephew of a judge. On the 27th of December, a court rejected an amnesty appeal by the driver of the car, who is serving a seven-year sentence. Ukrainian media say Irina Nozdrovska, who'd lobbied to have the appeal blocked, had allegedly received threats after the judgment. Ukraine's foreign minister, Pavlo Klinkin, described her killing as a challenge to the state and a test for society in terms of protecting women activists. Warren Bull. South Korea's Constitutional Court has upheld a controversial law that restricts the awarding of massage licenses and the ownership of massage parlours to blind and partially sighted people. Some think the century-old law is outdated. However, the court on Tuesday ruled that the massage business is virtually the only occupation that visually impaired people can normally enjoy. Jenna Park is a journalist in Seoul. Razia Iqbal asked her via Skype, what are the origins of this law? This law was first adapted while Korea was under the Japanese rule, and that brought in the first modern special education for the blind back then in the early 20th century, and it was only massage they brought in, no language learning or training. Does it surprise you now then that uh, the Constitutional Court has ruled that all professional massage services should be the preserve of the blind? Personally, it is a surprise because we're now in the 21st century and what the rule does exclude is the need for more opportunity for the visually impaired to improve their skills and expand their dreams. Not only remain like a Korean expression, a frog in a well, compelled to follow a skill or a field of work. Tell me why what the Constitutional Court has decided has been controversial. The other messers who are not blind, their argument is that it works against their freedom of choice of um, work or occupation. What do you think is going to happen then to those massage therapists who are not blind, who will continue to want to, to work in the field that they have trained in and, and possibly enjoy doing? I think people will be more creative linguistically in defining their jobs changing the names to aroma physical therapy or some other word. Do you think, though, that this, um, this decision by the Constitutional Court could force those people who want to carry on doing what they're doing, if they're not going to be creative and adventurous with the titles that they give themselves, could it drive a particular section of massage therapists underground? I fear so. Already there are certain businesses which are quite worrisome. From the outside, it looks like a perfectly legal entity, but one does fear whether it is really an actual legal place. Like, would you be welcome there or would the person behind the counter be expecting male customers more than women. What are we looking at in terms of the response to this decision? Do you suspect that there might be protests against it and, and that people are likely to, to just resist the implementation of it? This is the fourth decision by the court, but still, I think, because of the differences and the developments in the business, I do foresee protests will continue. But obviously, the best measure would be to offer more education and more training opportunity for the visually impaired and also for the other masses to walk parallel and have more parlours that are 
offering legal and good massages. Jinnah Park, a journalist in South Korea. Here in the UK, researchers in Oxford have developed an artificial intelligence system that can diagnose scans for heart disease much more accurately than doctors. It's thought the systems could save the National Health Service, or NHS, billions of dollars by enabling the diseases to be picked up much earlier. Here's our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh. On average, cardiologists in the UK get one in five of their diagnoses from heart scans wrong. Those patients are either sent home and may go on to have a heart attack or undergo unnecessary operations. This costs the NHS £600 million each year. A new artificial intelligence system that's been tried out in six hospitals does much better. Clinical trials suggest it could save hospitals £300 million a year. The system was trained to identify potential problems by being fed the scans of a 1,000 patients that have been treated over the past 10 years, along with information as to whether they went on to have heart problems. It was then able to identify patterns in the heart scans that doctors can't see. Sir John Bell, who's leading the government's industrial strategy for healthcare, says that such systems are set to revolutionise medicine. 20 years from now, healthcare will have AI embedded at a whole variety of different levels, and, and much of the healthcare system will be enabled by smart systems that help you identify people at risk, that diagnose disease earlier, diagnose disease more precisely, and identify who will benefit from what interventions. The heart disease system will be available to NHS hospitals for free next summer. Other AI systems are likely to follow soon to diagnose a variety of diseases, including breast and lung cancer. Palab Ghosh. We've all heard of maternity and paternity leave, but now there's a new trend. Poor paternity leave for pet owners. It's taken off in New York with tech startup companies among the first to allow workers leave for new dogs as well as newborns. Here in the UK, Bitsol, an IT company based in Manchester in northern England, prides itself as very dog friendly. As well as allowing hounds in, the boss, Greg Buchanan, also offers paternity pay. He told Susanna Streeter why. I got a puppy, or me and my wife got a puppy, and I needed to take some time off to work from home. So I took a week, and my wife took a week of annual leave. We then had a staff member who requested uh, some annual leave because he got a puppy. We said, well, why don't you take some leave extra to your annual leave in order to uh, facilitate that? So he was very happy with that. What kind of difference does it make? Morale. Morale is hugely improved. We're a fun place to work. We're a, a liberal place to work. And it, it just means that our staff work harder for us. So there's a survey by the animal welfare charity Blue Cross that says of the 2,000 pet owners it asked, more than four in ten have pulled a sickie from work because of their pet. You don't have that problem then at your office? No, uh, we definitely don't. I think everybody is a responsible staff member in the way that they don't take advantage of, of the situation. How many days do they take off in general, those people with pets? You're talking about uh, over the period of a year, just over a week, that includes a few days of, of being at home with the dog if, if they've just brought a, a pet into the family. What about those employees who don't have a pet? Do they find it unfair? All of our employees have pets, so it's uh, we, don't, we don't have that uh, issue here. I mean, somewhere like Manhattan or in the United States, across the board, really, where employers have come under fire for not offering enough paternity leave, do you think it's a bit unusual that at least a growing number of employers are offering leave for pets rather than humans? Yeah, I, I think the United States has a, a certain work ethos that isn't the same in the UK. I do have a lot of friends in the US that, that do have limited number of days of annual leave, let alone paternity leave uh, or maternity leave. You're talking 10 to 15 days a year, whereas here you're talking 20 to 25 days a year. So the UK is more adaptable to the idea of paternity leave. Doesn't your productivity suffer as a result of fewer people being in the office? Not at all. We don't departmentalise the, the organisation, so um, everybody's able to take up the slack of another individual that isn't in the office for whatever reason. When they're on those calls helping people with their IT problems, isn't there a risk of the dog barking if they're in the office? It does happen. It does happen. A lot of our customers know, or all of our customers know, that we have pets in the office. They do like that fact as well, so they do have a bit of a laugh when they're on a support call, uh, even when it's a serious support call. So we're absolutely fine with the dogs being vocal, <laughs> just not too vocal. <laughs>
Greg Buchanan from the Bitsol IT company. And that's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available for you to download later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm Alex Ritson. Until next time. Uh...